Now, while the earliest fossil evidence from Erectus comes from East Africa and places like Georgia, historically the earliest evidence for Erectus actually comes from Southeast Asia, from the island of Java. And it was the work of a Dutch human paleontologist, Eugene Dubois, who had the idea that humans descended out of tropical apes, but not African apes, but instead the orangs and other Southeast Asian apes. The idea essentially that humans emerged out of the tropics. And so he went to basically the Dutch East Indies in the late 19th century, and with the help of locals was able to recover quite a bit of early fossil material, fossil material that he thought was representative of a missing link. So on the island of Java, as it turns out, we have a number of very important fossil hominin sites for Homo erectus. Um, Java, pictured here in the southern Indonesian archipelago, seems today to be a long way away from where we might think of the main action of human evolution. But recall that during the Pleistocene, given the environmental and climatic shifts that were going on, throughout much of the Pleistocene, this area of Southeast Asia represented part of mainland Asia. So this is basically the corner of what was continental Asia for much of the Pleistocene. During the ice ages, as the glaciers mounted, ocean levels shrunk, and parts of what are today archipelagos were actually part of continental zones. And this is true with Java, and the important sites such as Trinil, Sanjaran, the Solo River Basin, and Mojo Kerto, some of which we'll talk about in this lecture, others of which you'll have review material associated with the fossil review section of this week's content. Now, what Eugene Dubois first discovered when he went to Java, some of the earliest remains he had was this skull cap coming from a site known as Trinil, and this femur coming from the Solo River Basin. Now for the skull cap for Dubois, what he recognized was that this was a relatively small but human-like skull. It had many of the features that we associate with human skulls in terms of its overall morphology, its shape, the projecting superorbital torus, but the brain size was small, about half that of living humans. At the same time, the femoral remains which he discovered were very much human. Now it turns out there's actually a long period of time probably separating this femoral remain and this skull cap, but for Dubois, he viewed them as part of a single collection, part of a basically small-brained, upright, bipedal human, what he referred to as Pithecanthropus, or ape-like human, erectus. These days, we refer to Pithecanthropus erectus as simply Homo erectus. We recognize it's part of our lineage. But you can see those remains here. And what you see on the cranial vault is that it's fairly long, but that it's quite low. Now again, we're missing the base of it, but even if you reconstruct that, you'd expect this to be a fairly low cranial vault. It has a long sloping forehead, a fairly flat superorbital torus that's broad and extends across the orbits. The femur, again, is probably much later in time, but represents a fairly fully modern human. This big projection of bone off here represents actually a pathology and isn't characteristic of the normal anatomy of this specimen. Dubois reconstructed this again. He thought it was basically a primitive upright human. This picture on the right actually depicts his own reconstruction of Pithecanthropus erectus using his son as a model. And what you see is a small-brained but very upright human, basically human in terms of its proportions, perhaps with a slightly elongated upper limb. Interestingly, he reconstructs the individual holding a stone tool, important for thinking about the use of tools in this context. Perhaps more interestingly, now keep in mind Dubois did not have any foot fossil bones, so he reconstructed the feet entirely based on what he imagined the specimen to be. And notice that if we zoom in on the feet, you can see that Dubois reconstructed Pithecanthropus erectus to have an abducted big toe, much like we saw actually earlier in Artipithecus. Now we know that this actually isn't correct. We know that Artipithecus might have been the last hominin specimen to have an abducted big toe. Even on Australopithecus afarensis, some three and a half million years ago, we have good evidence of an adducted big toe. But nevertheless, this reflects again a sense of trying to figure out the primitiveness of this specimen, or trying to project the primitiveness of this specimen. Now, as we already saw with the Nerecotome specimen, we know that with Homo erectus, from the neck down, we have essentially a fully modern human. The postcranial anatomy, unlike Dubois' reconstruction, is not primitive. It's actually quite modern. It's in the cranial anatomy, the size of the dentition, the size of the brain, that we see the primitive features in Homo erectus. Now, as it turns out again, there's a fairly rich fossil sample coming from Java from the lower and middle Pleistocene especially. And what we see when we look at this sample is the development of regional features, features which distinguish the fossils that we find in Southeast Asia from fossils that we find at this time period from other areas. Looking at Sanjuran 4 here, a partial skull, we can see some of the features that we saw in Trinil earlier. For example, we have this fairly projecting nuchal torus, this bar of bone that goes across the back. And indeed, if we look at the posterior part of that skull, we can see that it's a fairly continuous torus of bone that runs across the back, and it's actually quite broad. It's a little shelf of bone that actually just sticks off the back of the skull. 
We can again see a fairly low cranial vault, and again, although we don't have the anterior portion of this specimen, we would reconstruct it to be quite long. Looking at the maxilla, we can see that already we've reduced our dentition considerably from some of those earlier African specimens, early homo specimens that we saw before. We have a fairly large M1, but then a reduced M2, and a much reduced M3. The premolars are beginning to become very much like modern condition in terms of their overall reduction in size and their bicuspid morphology. We have a small apically worn canine, and we have a still a somewhat boxy overall maxilla in terms of the shape of the, the specimen. Other specimens from Sandron include Sandron 17. Now this is a large, robust male specimen. As it turns out, it's one of the only specimens from Sandron that preserves a face. So it gives us some glimpse as to what the face of these specimens might have looked like. And what we can see is a very broad projecting zygomatic. Indeed, this face might give us some recollection of those specimens from Dimenisi. Even the new specimen, which was just very recently published, which has a very broad projecting zygomatic cheeks on those faces. Now this specimen is quite a bit larger in terms of overall cranial capacity and the robustness of the face. But again, we see a big superorbital torus existing as a fairly continuous bar across the front. We see a little bit of projection to the face. You can see this big hulking cheek right here. Again, we have a long linear vault with a fairly low cranial vault overall, limiting its cranial capacity. Looking at other specimens from the area, Sambung Machan is a slightly later middle Pleistocene site from the island of Java. Here are two specimens from that site. And again, we can see a very similar superorbital torus as we observed earlier. As a fairly continuous bar, perhaps with a little bit of arching over each orbit, extending as a shelf across the front. So if we look at these specimens, we can actually see that the superorbital torus extends directly into this long sloping forehead, with no separation between them. So there's just this shelf of bone that goes straight into the forehead. And if we look at the forehead, we can see a little bit of what we refer to as a frontal keel on these specimens. So the developing of a buttress of bone that runs right through the midline of the specimen. Again, this turns out to be a characteristic feature of these Southeast Asian specimens. Here we see Sambung Machan 1 on the right again, compared to Sambung Machan 3 on the left, another specimen from the site. And again, we can see these long skulls that are low in terms of their overall cranial dimensions, the superorbital torus projecting off the front, nuchal torus projecting off the back on both specimens, a fairly long sloping forehead with a little bit of a sagittal keel running down the midline, or again, this buttressing of bone running down the middle of the specimens, and many of the same features that we've seen before. If we look on the lateral side of the parietals and the temporal bones, we see this arch of bone, this development of bone that we refer to as an angular torus. Again, a feature that we see distinctively within the specimens from Southeast Asia. So overall, we see a fairly continuous pattern of evolution in the early specimens from Southeast Asia. And beginning next week, we'll see this actually continue into the later specimens from Southeast Asia as well. But from earlier specimens such as Trinil, we see a replication of that form in later specimens. In terms of the overall shape of the vault, some of the specific features of the vault, such as the long sloping forehead, the frontal keel that extends into a sagittal keel, for example, if we look at the face of the specimen, we can again see characteristic features that we'll see replicated in later specimens from this area. And these regional features, the development of traits that distinguish different regions, is something that we're going to see replicated as we look at specimens from East Asia and specimens from Europe as well. Part of the understanding of Homo erectus is understanding what it means to evolve a cosmopolitan species, a species that extends across geographic time and space, one that might have the development of different regional types within that overall species, or that some might interpret as different species altogether. This is an issue that I'll raise as we move throughout this week, and as we come back at the end of the week to recap exactly how we understand these patterns of regional variation. Do they represent geographic isolation and associated speciation of these different populations? Or do they represent simply regional populations within a broad, connected, geographically dispersed species, a single lineage in other words?